Hello, everybody. How is everybody going today, doing today? See, I'm going to make a grammar mistake right off the bat. That's the whole point. We're talking about grammar errors today, uh, specifically uh, five grammar mistakes that even accomplished writers might make. And so along the way, if you catch any grammar mistakes, you let me know. Yeah. Okay. And there will be some twists and turns along the way. But some of this, some of this list is... Um, Based on you know our own experience uh, looking at people's work and obviously conversations with with uh, editors, uh, the type of things that they often see. Uh, and again, even when this is an author that they've worked with for years, and uh, these things still slip through. So I guess during today's stream, while we're while we're going across some of these things, let us know in the comments if there's anything that you know you always get trapped by. <laughs> we can or make our. Read. Yeah, or or see when you're reading things, we can uh, make our list a little longer as we as we chat about it. Yep, <laughs> we have to do a follow up episode. Uh, yeah, there are certain. I think everybody has their pet peeves that jump out to them on the page or irritate them or whatever. So uh, if you have any, shout it out. Let us know. Well, it looks like we have people from all over here, so we're gonna have a wide variety of opinions. Colorado, Mobile, Palm desert lexington south carolina chicago hawaii illinois auto ontario houston tampa that's awesome i love it all over i was gonna say well we, we would see if there's anybody uh, anybody else from the uk showing up in here because i think some of these things that we talk about may have different approaches based on uh, american and british english that's a good uh, point that's a so good that may you know some of the things that are covered here uh you know you may you may be watching and gritting your teeth and going, well, not by my style guide. <laughs> that's true. And that's the other thing, too, is a lot of these things are based on your style guide. You know, a lot of people will use this style guide and then you'll get another editor and they use this style guide. And all of a sudden it's like, that's not how you do that. And you're like, oh, I, I didn't know. You know, uh, some of this does get a little bit subjective, but to that point, if a lot of these things are subjective and maybe somewhat arbitrary, I have a question. Why should we even worry about grammar? Should we even worry about grammar? Is this all just stylistic choice? You know, isn't this art? Are we writing academic essays or are we uh, writing prose? What purpose does grammar have within writing? What do you think, Earth? How important do you think grammar should be to the artist? Right. Now, to to a certain degree, grammar is extremely important. Obviously, it's it's the uh, you know the the connective tissue of language. Um, and what is um, most important to me when it comes to any kind of writing is legibility, understandability. Um, does the message come through? Uh, and this is one of the things that you know. I guess uh, within the autocrit community and everybody else, I have a reputation as being kind of hardline uh, sort of person. But you may be surprised to know, not entirely when it comes to strict grammar rules. Mm. Um, there are some of the things that we will cover uh, in this session, and I will jump in and say, but as far as I'm concerned, <laughs> the, 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 the but. Mm. Um, no, I'm more, I am more, um, as an editor, as a storyteller, more concerned with the story. Uh, on the structure and whether the story that you are saying that you are telling is involving uh, and part of it being as involving as it could be is that it's easily understandable right i can read it and not stumble uh, and sometimes if creating that effect uh, and making sure that i don't stumble um means you've got to break a few a few rules uh, in terms of grammar well hey i'm not gonna i'm not gonna stand in the way of that <laughs> yeah, for me, when I think of grammar, I'm going to use a maybe an unusual metaphor here, but I think a little bit of something like fashion in terms of art. And so there are typical rules that are followed for clothing and things like that style. Uh, if you break big rules, guess what? You stand out. And maybe this is a conscious choice, but imagine this person is trying to draw attention to their very stylistic necklace while by wearing the big bunny mask, they've, they've kind of given attention to the wrong place. And that's where I think grammar mistakes, especially some of the ones we're gonna talk about, can really hurt you because some, some of them are just so obvious to the audience that 
they'll wonder, well, why are you even doing that? And it's going to draw so much attention to itself that it's not benefiting you to break the rule. And of course, uh, the other thing when it comes to grammar is it's really the packaging of your work. Everybody knows you can buy a really uh, beautiful looking gift. And uh, if your packaging looks terrible, like when I try to do gift wrapping, this is why I'm not <laughs> that looks to do exactly it. like one of my wrapped Christmas presents. <laughs> exactly right. So um, again, you know, this could have a beautiful gift inside, but by doing that, you're just hurting the presentation. So grammar really is that presentation, and we want it to disappear in the sense it's kind of an annoying thing to think about because you don't really want people reading your work unless I don't know they're very nerdy, but to be like, wow, the grammar was just fantastic. You know, you really want it to disappear. But what you don't want is it to draw attention itself either by you're breaking it all over the place and it's just drawing attention to itself, or it just makes you look really sloppy, like you uh, don't know what you're doing. And of course, it can go so far as to damage the work to where it's not understandable anymore. So we want to avoid all of that. So that being said, let's go into five common grammar mistakes and before we do that i'm just curious what some of uh, our uh, audience members might think are some of the grammar mistakes out there uh, we'll be going through them one by one i'm not going to lay them all out all at once so you could be going through and you can say what you think are grammar mistakes out here all right the first one I'm going to give. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. Uh, I was going to say I can see Daryl in, in the comments already is thinking uh, singular ending s possessive, and plural noun possessive. Yeah. Is yeah. Um, so the first one I'm going to talk about is one that's more. Uh, it, it's a little more subtle, and I feel like it really gets a lot of people, and that is comma splicing. Now, we all know how commas work, right? Commas are always an indicator of when somebody is taking a breath. No, that, that's not really what commas are, but that's what people like to use them for. And so they'll put commas all over the place, even when they're not intentional, they're not needed. Like, I climbed into the stunning spaceship, a smiling alien was on board. Well, this is actually not great on many levels, right? <laughs> it really should be a period in between and you're just putting two cent two clauses together that it they don't go well together so <laughs> yes uh, i can see in the comments there from uh the sword oxford. and shield the, the oxford, oxford comma no. is life i will yeah, i live. need that one i will die on that hill <laughs> yeah yes uh, what is Oxford that famous color. example? It's like the let's eat grandpa, right? Or what is it? Or <laughs> <laughs> it's like it saves lives. Yeah, no, right. So let's let's imagine you had an example like this. What you would want is something more like I climbed into the stunning spaceship, period, it's smiling when I was bored, or semicolon in between. By putting the comma in between, you're just putting two things together. That's not necessary. So. Yes, to, to to really nail it down, the the comma splice um, is probably the thing that I see the most often um, when editing or, or looking at other people's work. Um, it happens all the time. And to kind of explain it just in that technical sense is that, yes, as you can see on the screen there, it, it happens when you have two independent clauses and you use a comma to join them. Uh, these, are, these are technically two sentences. Mm -hmm. um, the easiest way around it if you're trying to make these two statements, uh, is uh, also simply use a conjunction. Don't use a comma. Use and or but or whatever it is that makes sense as a conjunction to join those two things together. Uh, don't just drop a comma in there. Yep. And that would be, I climbed into the stunning spaceship and a smiling alien was on board, right? Or is the comma even needed now? Well, that's the Oxford. I like it. <laughs> <laughs> right. So this is where this is where maybe it gets a little more subjective, but it certainly reads a lot better to have I climbed into the stunning spaceship, comma, and a smiling alien was on board than I climbed into the stunning spaceship, comma, a smiling a alien was on board. Because it's just like you're trying to blend two things together and it's choppy and it doesn't read well. And I feel like it can really it really can hang you up, especially get a bunch of those on a row, which I've gotten before. And uh, 
Yeah, I think uh, quite right. Some of the things that we will uh, mention or, or discuss as we go through these points today um, is that, you know, as we said, often often it, it's, it's still fully understandable. Um, you can read it and kind of get what's going on. But um, as much as I can be soft on that side of things, when it comes to comma splices, it's just no. I, I err too much on the side of it being clunky. Yeah, exactly. Now, another way you could uh, fix this is by adjusting the wording. I climbed into the stunning spaceship and I saw that a smiling alien was on board. Now you have um, a, a second clause that is not independent. And so now the comma is necessary. It's no longer subjective. <laughs> Although, really, is the Oxford comma ever subjective? I don't think so. <laughs> <laughs> there's right and there's wrong there's right and there's wrong the people that don't use the oxford comma are wrong now uh i like uh bob who's saying uh is there such a thing as a non-studying spaceship <laughs> uh, yeah i didn't say this was a great example of writing overall and somebody's like <laughs> this is telling not showing autocrit has destroyed me yes Yes, you are correct. Yes, you are correct. And and honestly, too, uh, to the point of showing, not telling, I do think that sometimes like rules tend to overlap, right? And so sometimes people are so concerned of, well, isn't that spelling it out to phrase it in such ways? And isn't it going to hit that report? And it's going to be a show, don't tell kind of indicator and all of that. Yeah, fair enough. But uh, I would say be careful with those sort of rules and how they overlap because you don't want to paint yourself into a corner where you're uh, making a grammatical mistake just to avoid a show don't tell sort of situation. You know, yeah. uh, it's all balance. <laughs> That's the, hey, relax guy. <laughs> exactly. And uh, certainly with the uh, autocrit software, we always tell you don't let it bully you. So just because it gives you an indicator uh, doesn't mean you have to be like, ah, I've got to, blow up this paragraph, you know, not necessarily, not necessarily. It could be not worth the effort. Certainly, which we're not going to talk about today, passive, passive has a, has a use. So you don't have to freak out every time it tells you you're using passive. Uh, let's just do one more example, though. Whoops, sorry, let me keep going. Uh, I love examining dead bodies. Corpses are fascinating. <laughs> See, this is the same thing where that top, really putting the comma in between it, it's not benefiting you because those are two independent thoughts. Period is better. If you wanted to put them together, I love examining dead bodies because corpses are fascinating or something like that. Yeah, what, what have you been thinking about recently? <laughs> <Daniel>. <laughs> I like coming up with unusual, just to, just to warn everybody, uh, my examples might be a little bit peculiar because I tend to like to write unusual examples because they're just much more fun to read. I'm just sick of, you know, the, although really the, what is it? The, the short brown fox jumped over the lazy dog or whatever. It's like, that's kind of weird. What kind of, <laughs> what kind of fox is jumping over a dog? And I don't know. Anyway, let's do number two, and that is uh, misused words. Yes, uh, words that are we're putting in the incorrect word for that sentence. This is something that can get a lot of people because these are words that you're spelling correctly, but you're actually using the wrong word. And this is another one where I would say this is not really – this is even maybe less of a subjective thing than – comma, <laughs> comma usage, because this can make you look like you don't know your language, or it can even be confusing as to what you're even talking about. I would much rather go skiing down Mount Everest than sleep over at my mother-in-law's house, which I love my mother-in-law, though, if she was watching, hi. Uh, <laughs> but uh, yes, uh, the then there is incorrect. It should be than T H A N. This is one that most people know. I think. I think our. I think our audience uh, knows the difference between then and than. However, that doesn't mean when you're typing really fast, when you're doing NaNoWriMo and you're going a mile a minute, you might miss it and you might continue to miss it, and then somebody will catch it later, and it just makes you look rather foolish. So keep an eye out for it. Yeah, these kinds of typos are why everybody should be using proofreaders. Yeah, I mean, because no offense to our software, it's great, but, you know, it's not always going to catch something like this. Sometimes uh, it can, even word use, but, you know, it's tough because 
it has to really have that extra thinking of, well, this is a word that exists. It's just not the right word for the situation, you know? <laughs> and that's tough. That's, that's very difficult. Also, what helps is if you can't afford an editor, uh, if you know anybody that is just a stickler for things like that, any English teachers or anything like that, you know, try, try that as well. At least that'll clean up your manuscript a lot. I'm beginning to wonder if that purple mushroom I ate is having an effect on me. Yeah, this is another one. <clears throat> People get thrown off by the difference between effect and affect. Gareth, do you know the difference? <laughs> yes. <laughs> Something will affect you, and what it causes is the effect that it has. Yes, exactly. One's a verb, one's a noun. Yes, um, I'm gonna. I feel like I, this is a this is a tricky one to do live because I'm like I know I'm gonna make a big mistake. So if I make a mistake, you let me know because, like I said, these are these are one these are mistakes that even uh, what we what we say accomplished writers do. So you know, you can call <laughs> me out. <laughs> Oh, somebody had a good one, and this is actually not one I'm going to bring up. Wander, uh, go away, or wonder, which is awe. Yeah, that's that's a that's that's a typo for sure. The train conductor accepted my ticket and helped me onto the hovering train with a smile. Yeah, that's another one. Um, accepted versus accept, like. He's not making an exception for you. He is uh, accepting something. To make an exception is to have a specific circumstance in which a normal rule doesn't apply. Accepting something means allowing it to take place, you know, grabbing yeah, it, whatever so it is. I think if he was accepting your ticket, you would not be getting on that train. Yeah, unless he was like, I don't think you can use it like that, but it's like, oh, I'll make a exception for you. But I don't think that works like that kind of verb. <laughs> <laughs> he's ex he's like, I don't. You would put it a different way. He's making an exemption for you. So or took exception to or took exception. Yeah, exactly. All right, moving on. On that topic as well, one of the things uh, I guess I just have to raise it because it's something that on a daily basis annoys me about yeah. social media is people using the word a lot, A-L-O-T, instead of two words, a lot. I don't oh. know if anybody else uh, watching has that same, just, I don't know, I grind my teeth <laughs> as yeah, I'm reading social no, media. I understand, yeah, a lot. Um, there's also phrases, too, like, um, and now I'm blanking out on them, but uh, for all intents and purposes yeah for for all intensive purposes yeah but they'll say for all and like all in, it's it gets <laughs> all messed up it's like all all of tense and purposes and i'm like no it's not about the tense of the language or just all or all intensive purposes too so it's like for all the passionate purposes but that's not what it is it's all intents and purposes yeah uh, another one that comes up a lot is uh, eg versus ie though people will mix that up Mm, yeah. Because IE is I IE is that is to say an EG is for example. And they'll say um something and they'll say IE and it's an example. It's not that is to say. People do that all the time. So and honestly, it's like why are you using whatever Latin acronyms if you don't know know what they are? <laughs> maybe versus maybe. Yeah, that can actually confuse what you even mean in a sentence when you do that. A while ago, being Southern, a while ago was always a while ago, and it was an adult before I learned that was not the thing. <laughs> I love that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, dialect can really uh, uh, to, can do that, especially, I think, too, we're getting to, uh, with a lot of these examples, is that you do not notice uh, the problem when you read it out loud, especially, like, accept versus accept. Uh, you know, they read the same, so you would have to know which one, which way to spell it. Not, it's a homophone. You wouldn't know which word to use necessarily. So it's a little bit harder to catch. What about when you want things to be fair for artistic gymnastics, it's best to have disinterested judges. Okay, I actually pulled a fast one on you. This is actually correct. It's just most people don't think this is correct because disinterested sounds like they're not interested, but that's actually uninterested. Disinterested means 
that they are impartial. So it's actually, uh, that actually was a correct example. I was just seeing if you're paying attention. <laughs> but yeah, this is something where people will say that um, somebody is uninterested when they really mean disinterested or vice versa. It comes up from time to time. All right. What about the cat was farther away from building his fish catcher than the dog was? I think somebody mentioned this in the comments. <laughs> yes, um, it should be further, not farther. Farther is distance. Further is how long you are in the process of something. Um, two different things. So this is another one that comes up a fair amount. Because I don't think a lot of people know that difference. I don't know. What do you think, Gareth? Have you come across this? Uh, yeah, it, it, it's it's a it's a quite a common trip, actually. Uh, it can be difficult to figure out. I think mostly a lot of people, as they're just kind of writing out the draft, you know, either a flip of a coin, whether farther or further comes out <laughs> as, they, as they're putting the word down on the page. Yep. All right. I this can see a, good... uh, a comment from Sword and Shield there. Irregardless. Now, if I am <laughs> not mistaken, I believe irregardless might have actually been officially uh, it is. recognized. However, we have to always remember dictionaries just recognize based on usage. For example, a lot of people don't like uh, uh, individuals using literally to mean metaphorically, but the dictionary does allow for that definition because it is just so commonly used yeah. that, you know, I literally did whatever. And for all of, for, and I know that is one that really triggers people in writing. However, you can point to Mark Twain and Charles Dickens, who did use literally to mean metaphorically. So if you're an author and you like to talk <laughs> like that, I'm just saying, you got an out. <laughs> Should be the uh, the description, you know, literally meaning not literally. <laughs> you no, know, that's what it says. Yeah, literally meaning metaphorically. And you're like, okay, uh, okay cool. But I honestly, I feel like why people, this is kind of a random tangent, but it's just coming to mind. Uh, why people use literally incorrectly, like not precisely, is that it's kind of changing what would be a simile construction to a metaphor construction. Because if I say, you know, I am a beast, nobody's like, oh, really? You're literally a beast? But essentially, that's what I'm saying. I'm saying I'm literally a beast. So it's just changing what, uh, you know, I'm like a beast, which was is the way it should be. That's a, that's a simile. So essentially, it's just another way of doing a metaphor construction. And I think that even though I don't like it because I like more precise language, I at least understand where it came from. So anyway, that's my little rant on literally to mean metaphorically. <laughs> <laughs> and everyone's and I'm gonna watch the YouTube traffic be like, and at this point <laughs> <laughs> I know you like your nerdy discussions, don't you? Come on, give me a shout out. All right, let's people move who on. are people who are literally loving the discussion. <laughs> literally. They're literally captivated. They're literally glued to their seats. Um William lay down for a nap over an hour ago. Okay, I did it to you again. This one doesn't is is correct, but that's because this gets very confusing because why and lay uh, drive this one drives me bananas. I can't tell you how many times I've had to look this up because you have lie, which is to recline, right? And then you have lay to set something down. But the past tense of lie recline is lay. <laughs> and then the past tense of lay is laid. So it could really throw you off. This so, yeah. This uh, this, this this one I I absolutely hate. <laughs> you know I, I hate, hate this one. I hate this one so much that I literally avoid like this verb altogether. If it's talking, I know that lay and lay is laid is correct for an object, and because I constantly I'm like lie or lay, and it never reads right to me because I always want to say somebody laid down because so many people say that, and so I just want to be I just just avoid it. I just pick another verb. I'm like they relaxed. <laughs> <laughs> they're slouched or something. Yeah, just ad up on it. <laughs> admitting that I do exactly the same. The only time I will ever <laughs> use it is if uh, a character says, I need to lie down. Otherwise, it's just, I, I am not even, I don't have the brain space for that. Mm -mm. Yeah. Oh, sit is uh, restive and set is to place it. That makes sense. Yeah. But that one I feel like is more ingrained. I would never say, you know, the person set down. That just sounds so wrong. But I do want to say the person lay down 
Like, I don't know. I guess maybe, I, I bet in conversation, we we just use the wrong word more often, even though sit and set sound very similar. Especially if you have a Southern <laughs> accent, you have no way of telling those words apart. And so, yeah, Salissa in Hawaii, don't forget the lay, L-E-I. <laughs> oh, that's true. <laughs> and yes, yes, lay, yes. Yes, so you have to lay your lay if you're setting it down something. You don't lie your lay. All right, moving on. Uh, this is actually an example from The Hunger Games. I have a few examples from The Hunger Games because, you know, even professional authors will do things like this. For the next 60 minutes, the capital feed alternates between the standard afternoon broadcast, Finnick, and attempts to black it all out. Technically, this is not the correct use of between. It should be among because between is really only supposed to be between one of two things, technically. So I'm just saying, that's another one that gets people. Although that one I think of is, that one's pretty particular. I would think there's only a handful of people that would know it. I don't know, Gareth, uh, among and between, is that something that sets you off? No, not not, not really. <laughs> um, I'm trying to parse this sentence as well, though. It's, 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 it's kind of stumbly because is, is Finnick the standard afternoon broadcast or is that something else? No, the standard afternoon broadcast, Finnick, and attempts to black it all out. It's oh, okay. Two different thing. It's it's three different things. It's alternating between. It's the standard afternoon broadcast, Finnick, and attempt. In context, that wouldn't be so weird. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I was just trying to parse it together there. It's like spot the guy who has not read The Hunger Games. <laughs> all right. Now let's talk about misplaced modifiers. These are fun sentences to read. I like these. Like... Dialing on the cell phone, Felix gave a loud meow at the sound of his button mashing. <laughs> um, yeah, um, the problem with this is that it makes it look like Felix is the person who's dialing on the cell phone when it's not, because it's just placed that that is placed in a weird area of the sentence. And you might be like, well, this is blatantly obvious. Well, guess what? There's an example in the Hunger Games of this as well. So you just wait. It's going to get a little <laughs> bit more interesting. <laughs> what about because of his immense popularity, Drake knew that Bob would need extra security precautions. So it seems obvious, but not like, is it Drake that needs the immense, it has the immense popularity or is it Bob? I'm not entirely sure. Imagine that the intention is that you want it to be Bob. This would not be a good construction because Im immediately the reader is going to think that Drake is the one who has the immense popularity. However, considering Bob is the one that needs the extra security precautions, my guess is that he's the person with the immense popularity, right? So. Yeah, it's a it's a tricky one. I see James in the comments mentioning on the previous example as well the danger of starting with ing. Yeah, starting with continuous verbs um, is uh, more often than not, I think, uh, starting off on very precarious ground mm -hmm. as as you complete that sentence. Yeah, uh, you need to be very careful. It's kind of like it is starting with action, right? And it's almost like starting a book with action. It's like you have no orientation. So it's like you know, if your book started with you know, the gun shot him in the chest. It's like, okay, cool, but who's this person and where are they? And you know what I mean? So it's kind of the same thing when you start with that ing verb. It's like, you're like thrust right into it. It's like, okay, where's my footing? And in context, it can work, but you have to be very careful. Yeah, I think I, I, I read something quite recently. I, I can't remember what it was now, but uh, there was a, a mention of a sentence like that. It was sort of lifting the knife. He swiftly cut through uh, like the ropes or whatever. And I'm like, okay, well, if that's continuous, so as, as he kind of, as he picked it off the floor, spun around in a circle and <laughs> right. cut all these ropes. That doesn't make sense. Yeah, that's a that's another thing that we're not going to talk about today. But that's a great thing that maybe we should talk about sometime. And that is uh, more mechanical things like uh, people doing more things at once than they should be able to do, and things like that. Where just the writing, if you actually thought about it, doesn't make a lot of sense what you're saying. She arrived home and fell onto the sofa, covered in sweat. I love this. <laughs> it's like, wow, um, what's going on with her furniture at the house? Um, but this is something, this is, this is where you get into more of the examples that writers will fall into. And that is, uh, you know, it's certainly understandable what the writer was trying to say. 
but this isn't the best construction because you it just reads clunky even if you understand it. So I would, uh, again, be careful. Be careful where you're modifying and whether or not. <laughs> okay, Daryl. Daryl's like he wishes his couch was like that. I, all right. Um, maybe it's warm where you are, but I don't know. I still don't want sweat. That's terrible. Yeah, um, write the story, Daryl. Live your dreams. Sweat sofa. <laughs> I know it's like your story. Prompt. Your writing prompt is my sofa is covered in sweat. Uh, <laughs> like it. Oh, I love this. Okay, this is great. Starting a sentence with ing is um. Never mind. <laughs> I just like that. <laughs> it's true. All right. This is an example from the Hunger Games. Remember, I promised it to you. My bow is a rarity crafted by my father along with a few others that I keep well hidden in the woods. It kind of sounds like she's got this whole <laughs> battalion of people that she's kept hostage in the woods. Not the best. Not the best. And I'm oh, sorry, Stan Collins, but you know, you have your millions of dollars to keep you happy. I can I can riff on you a little bit. And I do like a more interesting, uh, interesting story for me. You know, <laughs> Everdeen is actually a raging psychopath. Yeah, I don't know. Yeah, maybe, maybe Suzanne Collins is going to do a spinoff, and she's going to like pay this off. Uh, <laughs> but yeah, obviously, what she's trying to get across is that she has other bows that she keeps in the woods, but this one is unusual because it was made by her father. Although, even then, I'm not, a, I'm not 100 percent sure. I'm guessing because it's his rarity. But I mean, maybe it's a rarity for society. I'm guessing it might be. And then are all of them crafted by your father? Yeah, this is not a great sentence, Suzanne Collins. I'm sorry. I'm a little confused. Um, but see, this is my editor brain coming out. <laughs> uh, speaking of which, if you enjoy my editor brain, uh, we do have author services. You can get um, uh, story inspections by me or Catherine or others, and uh, we can help you avoid some of these. So check it out on Autocred. All right. Sentence fragments. This is Garrett's favorite topic because he hates sentence fragments with a passion. He's going to nail you every time, right, Gareth? I dare you. <laughs> I, I, am, I am a big, big fan of fragments. <laughs> when we were we were talking about this earlier, and I knew fragments were going to be on here, um, simply by vir uh, virtue, virtue might be the wrong word, but uh, the fact that, yes, they are grammatically incorrect. Um, this is probably my number one tell for whether or not I want to work with an editor um, is whether they are completely hard line on no fragments. Um, we'll obviously look at uh, what fragments are here and uh, how you can work with them. But I, I think sentence fragments are wonderful for, for multiple uh, reasons um, and what you can, what you can do with them, the, the utility that they hold. And uh, when to me, if an editor replies to me with a, run through of a chapter or something and all they've done is fix fragments uh we're not going to be able to work together <laughs> yeah seriously well i mean and the truth of the matter is is fragments um are grammatically incorrect however a lot of times we uh with our pros uh will use fragments because we want the paragraph to sound more conversational. We want the prose to sound more conversational, or perhaps we're doing it for rhythm reasons. We want to have that, you know, quick, uh, rhythmic passage. Um, let's take a look, though, at why fragments can kind of trip you up. Because I'm going to put a whole bunch in a row. I walked outside. It was wet because of the rain. A wet ground of mulch dripping through the terrain. Yeah, if you do a whole bunch of them, it starts to read weird. It starts to read like it's haiku or something, um, which maybe that's what you're going for. Maybe this is somebody that is in the middle of some sort of sleepwalky, you know, mindset or they're they're disoriented. Uh, fragments can work really well for that. I mean, a, a sentence like because of the rain is a fragment, but that could work perfectly well on its own. You know, a wet ground of mulch. That could work well on its own too. It doesn't, it's not any of these sentences on their own that's really a huge problem. But as you can see, when you just do them over and over again, it's almost like the bunny mask, right? You're just drawing so much attention to the choppiness of the prose that you're going to run into trouble, I think. What do you think, Gareth? What, why, what, when do you think is a, a what, why do you think there's a good reason to use a fragment versus maybe when you're overusing it? 
Well, I would say, yeah, I, I see a comment there from Elaine, you know, fragments can be our friends. Uh, and very much so. Um, for me, a lot of the time they are uh, really great for getting into a character's head in terms of narration uh, with these kind of half thoughts um, and where the, the thought contained in the previous sentence kind of leads into the next, but you fragment at the beginning to, to join them more quickly. You know, you don't need to uh, make it a, a fully grammatically correct sentence. Uh, on the other hand, um, they really help speed up action as well. Um, if you're writing like an action thriller and you have, you know, uh, spin left, check sights, pull trigger, you know, this kind of thing, it really can pump up uh, an action scene. And uh, that th simply wouldn't wouldn't be as as punchy uh, were you not to rely on fragments. Yep. Um, right. And uh, uh, technically, uh, since I didn't go into specifically technically what a fragment is, generally speaking, they are a word without a subject or a verb. Although it can also just be the, there's another way that you can get to a fragment, <laughs> but generally speaking, it's without a subject or a verb. So it's not clear. For example, in this, um, you have a wet ground of mulch. There's no verb there. It's just it's just a noun and adjectives. And then you have dripping through the terrain. There's no subject there. There's just something dripping. You don't know what it is. I mean, you can surmise based on the paragraph, but it is uh, it is a fragment. Now, what if you wanted to fix something like this? Well, you might end up with, I walked outside because of the rain. I was met with a wet ground of mulch. Raindrops fell across the train, which took something that sounded kind of staccato and artistic to something very ordinary. Um, where So you can see where maybe you don't want to have extreme one or the other. You might want a combination of some fragments from time to time for those punchy moments. And to Gareth's point, for pacing purposes, uh, I really think of fragments as a as a as either a way to make it sound more conversational, because people often speak in fragmented sentences, or for rhythm purposes, just to cut to the chase and get through something, or to show disorientation. Those are like the three things I can think of. Let's look at another example. The woman glared at me, must be my hairstyle gazed into my very soul, awkward situation. I would say for this, I don't hate the, the, the woman glared at me. Must be, I, the gazed into my very soul is the one that stands out to me. But the other two just sounds pretty natural. Must be my hairstyle, awkward situation. You know what I mean? What do you think, Gareth? Yeah, I, I agree. I think uh, the, the gazed into my very soul, uh, as I like to say, over eggs the pudding. Uh, and that just kind of ruins it right there but i like the just again the punch of that awkward situation you know it's, it's just a, a thought a quick little thought that comes through there um mm -hmm. and when you work with that kind of thing you can easily um find a character's voice um uh, whose head we're trying to be in uh, inside the narration you know if this were an art of prose obviously it's not dialogue they're not speaking but we get to feel who they are uh, and by the by the by the rhythm of their thoughts and, and what they're doing, so I quite like that. Just awkward situation, um, but yeah, the third line there, yeah, yeah. I also think that um, this is going to vary based on the rules you've set up for yourself. To Gareth's point, you know, if the prose started out as very conversational first person and it just, you know, reads like somebody telling you a story, fragments are not going to stand out nearly as much as if it's, you know, third person omniscient and, and you know, sounds very formal. And then all of a sudden it's like, wait, where did this come from? This person just got, you know, very casual in their their speaking style, or if it's uh, you know a third person limited, where it's more uh, objective sounding, where it doesn't quite sound as much like you know you're quite in the character's head as much. It's a little more distant. Um, it can sound weird as well. It, I, it 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 depends on the context. It depends on the context. I, don't, I like Anne's suggestion in the comments. You could just say awkward. Yeah, you <laughs> could just work. say awkward. I don't know if situation is needed. That's true. Awkward. That's also a little bit more common. Like, because people just say awkward. They don't really say awkward situation. Although maybe I'll start doing that because that's weird. Okay, <laughs> moving on. <laughs> I'm like, that sounds great. <laughs> uh, subject verb agreement. Yes, this one's lots of fun. Because <laughs> uh, uh, this is one where there is 
an objective answer to something like this. And I really don't recommend violating it on purpose for some sort of stylistic reason. However, whether or not people are going to catch it is based on how knowledgeable they are about the way that certain sentences, how certain construction of certain sentences can manufacture what seems like counterintuitive uh, subject verb agreement. So let's, let's do a little quiz here and I'm going to give you sentences and uh, you're going to have to tell me um, which one is correct. Okay. There is or are many reasons to flee the burning castle. It's going to get harder, too, so it starts out pretty easy. <laughs> <laughs> like give me a challenge, Daniel. <laughs> so what is it? Is or are? There is or are many reasons to flee the burning castle. I'm waiting. There's a little bit of a delay, I think, on our feed. And that would be... There are, yes, there are many reasons to flee the burning castle because um, it's uh, many reasons. So you would want a plural verb, not a singular verb. All right, let's move on. Robert, Charles, and Thomas attack or attacks the giant monster. <laughs> Going with pirate talk, R, like that. All right, Robert, Charles, and Thomas attack or attacks the giant monster. This is fun. It's like, uh, like, like who wants to be a millionaire or something? Is that your final answer? All right, we got attack, attack, attack. Yes, that is correct. It is attack. Robert, Charles, and Thomas attack the giant, giant monster. All right, let's move on. The friendship between the citizenry of many planets that make up the universe stand or stand strong. <laughs> See, I told you it was going to get a little trickier. Generally speaking, I find uh, the distance between the verb and what the verb is talking about, and the more words you put in between, the more challenging it can get to keep track of what it should be. Oh, we're getting different answers. <laughs> we got a mix on this one. It should be stand strong because it is the friendship stand strong. Just get rid of all the rest of it in between. But see, all that stuff in between fooled some of you a little bit. It gets challenging. All right. A study in ethics prepare prepares you for a life as a police detective. I'm curious. Lucky coin for the win. <laughs> yeah, just coin flip. It's like, yeah, I got a choice, singular, plural. Eh. <laughs> Ooh, we get we have a few different responses, but prepares is the most popular, and it is the correct one. Even though ethics ends in an S, it is not a plural. It is a singular thing. It's a singular study. So I see this fairly often when I edit for other people. Yep. Uh Either the carrot karaoke singers or the lettuce dancer has or have to give in. <laughs> and yes, I wrote this sentence. Again, Daniel, what have you been thinking about? <laughs> I want to know what a lettuce dancer even is. Is it a dancer who is lettuce or is it a dancer who dances with lettuce? That's the question. <laughs> We have the dancer that dances with lettuce, like a fan dance, like with giant heads of lettuce. is just amazing. Oh, okay, we're getting some different answers. Has, has. Okay, have, either. Okay, is, as, because the lettuce dancer is a single person. I know, weird, right? But apparently that's how you're supposed to write it. I don't make up these rules. I just demonstrate them. <laughs> Each of the aliens want or wants to eat me for dinner. The thing about subject verb agreement is that I grew up around uh, a prof uh, my dad teaching, who's an English teacher. Um, so he spoke correctly and he always corrected you all the time. So a lot of these things I just know inherently. I don't know why. <laughs> so it's fun talking about it. I'm like, and the reason why is it sounds right. <laughs> <You know? laughs> uh, each of the aliens want or wants to eat me for dinner. The answer is wants. Yes, because it's each. Each wants. Yes, even though the aliens are plural. All right. The first 
highest member of the kingdom as well as the lowest member of the kingdom has or have got to behave themselves. I really feel like it should be the most highest member. Anyway, don't pay attention to that part. <laughs> What do we think? This one's hard for me. What do you think, Gareth? Is this one tricky for you? Or do you think it's pretty easy? I'm, just, I'm looking at the sentence and I just want to remove the word first. I, I can do that <laughs> and, and help out. Yes. Hold on. Let's do a quick on the nose spot check here. All right. There. <laughs> uh, yeah, I'm going to fall on the side of has. And we have the answer is has yes, but that one that one that's a little tricky. That's a little tricky. So you can see where it may seem pretty obvious, but not always. But here's the thing. Let's say that you had put in have. Will a lot of people notice it? Yep. Will a lot of people not notice it? Probably. So <laughs> it's one of those things. Like I said, that grammar mistake is going to be as dodgy for you as uh, your audience is going to notice because yeah and often this one i think i've spoken about some things what was the previous one that i referenced a little while ago ah yes was, was the uh the word onto the difference between onto is one word or on space two two different words again one is a preposition um, yeah. however depending on the use there I, I once described that as something that would lead to a fist a fist fight in an english department um because people just can't really seem to agree on it, despite the fact that there are specific rules. Uh, subject verb agreement is the one thing to think about. It really can get tricky when you enter the realm of uh, collective nouns. Um, the one that always stands out to me is the crew. So if you're talking about the crew, uh, that is a collective noun that becomes a singular. Therefore, technically speaking, should be the crew is, not the crew are. However, both are viable. Uh, both will actually work. Uh, so we kind of scale back there a little bit in terms of what is uh, being hard, too hard line on it when uh, understandability is not suffering. You know, the, there's always that level of, uh, of of thinking of things when you're when you're editing. Um, now, part of that too is uh, when you mention the crew is you're kind of talking about them as again a collective singular, um, but there's still uh, usability there. If you were to say the crew are. Um, it's subconsciously, like the, the crew are sleeping in their bunks, let's say mm -hmm. that. Um, it subconsciously makes you think of them as individual people, not a single collective. Uh, so things like that are, are definitely permissible. Um, and I think there's there's probably something in there in the difference between British English and, and US English as well and how those are approached. Yeah, absolutely. So I, that's a good example of where you kind of get a little stylistic most of the time it's something that's either right or wrong for for subject verb agreement but yeah it just goes to show you though how there is an element of style and artistic choice in a lot of these things and so um the nice thing about being an artist is that uh, you can be like well whatever <laughs> i'm just gonna do things my way but remember be uh, careful about it but uh it's no longer english class there is no person that's going to come to you well, maybe somebody will, but you know, there's no official person that's going to come to you and give your book the you know, red pen and be like, mm -mm, this just can't be out in, in the world. That's not how it works. But with great power comes great responsibility, as they say. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Gareth. Well, I feel like we covered this pretty well. Um, if there are any uh, grammar rules, though, that we did not cover, feel free to comment about them because who knows? We might return back to. Uh, grammar rules at some point because i don't know you like that kind of nerd talk around here at least i do um so yeah feel That'll free be the title five more grammar rules you told us you hit <laughs> <laughs> exactly <laughs> convoluted arbitrary grammar rules we want to resent our ancestors for inventing in the first place <laughs> the show <laughs> all right but anyway um <clears throat> Thank you so much for joining us this week. We will be back here again on Tuesday at 1 p.m. Eastern, like we always are, to uh, cover some great uh, writing tips and whatnot. But are there any other events or anything you want to tell them about, Gareth? Anything going on in the Oh, community? there is a lot coming up uh, and oh, more really? also to be programmed. Um, 
if you uh, subscribe, make sure you are subscribed to the YouTube channel here. So on your screen there, scroll down a little, hit the button to subscribe. Uh, I believe if you hit the little bell as well, that you get notifications when we're going live and you'll get notifications of everything that's scheduled going forward. So of course, uh, next week we have uh, more mistakes that editors catch. Again, these are all coming off of our discussions uh, with editors and what we see in house. Um, after that, the week the week after, we're coming back to look at query letters, uh, which Ooh. is always a, always a fun thing. Uh, we have some more what's the scores coming up um, just at the end of August as well. We have a little session where we're going to pick apart some publishing myths that people believe. Um, that are not necessarily true. Um, and then getting into September, we're really digging a little more into uh, story structure. Um, yes, so excited that about month. that. So that's going to be fantastic. And uh, yeah, I see the comments there, Sword and Shield. It's your boy. Remember to like and subscribe. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> we'll have some sponsors. We'll, we'll, in the future, we'll do a little, uh, you know, a little pre-roll ad where we try to sell you something. Um, so yeah, all really, really great stuff coming up. Um, and uh, it's only gonna get bigger. So it is subscribe. Yes, yes, and uh, subscribe to our channel. And uh, if you aren't an Autocrypt member, become an Autocrypt member because you're missing out on our member events. We have a really great one coming up later today. Uh, and if you're an Autocrypt member and you haven't checked that out yet, make sure you go on to the Mighty Networks community and uh, uh, check it out because we have a whole schedule there. We have a lot of events coming up uh, over the next few months. We've uh, we've scheduled a, a great docket of events and uh, you can RSVP, which will remind you and all of that great stuff. So you don't have to remember, which is great for me because it reminds me all the time. And I'm like, oh wait, I gotta get ready. <laughs> Indeed, yeah. If, if, if you're not currently an Autocrypt member, uh, of course, we highly recommend it. Yes, <laughs> totally. Of course. Um, we do have, uh, besides our, our regular Tuesday things, uh, we have members-only events going on for uh, members of, of the platform. And uh, that includes uh, what's coming up this month. We have a Friday the 13th horror workshop with Ooh. myself. Um, we have Story Doctor kind of drop-in clinic sessions. You, you may notice that uh, on the Autocrypt website, we have the Story Doctor clinic as a purchasable option, you know, you, you you can come in and have 30 minutes of consultation, but also for our members, for our subscribers, we do that quite regularly uh, as part of the membership. So we just kind of open the doors, sit there for yep. an hour. People can come in and, and uh, talk to us and uh, help figure out story problems. Uh, we also have Pitch It uh, coming up again. Uh, some more guests lined up uh, in October. You know, October is going to be uh, the spooky month as it always is. So we have a yes. phobia story workshop that I'll be hosting yes. on there. Um, and of course, you know, as I mentioned, uh, extra guests who you're showing up all the time. So uh, if you are a member, <clears throat> you do get the opportunity to uh, come in and join us in live events with guests and ask them questions. You know, these could be authors, editors, uh, artists uh, of all kinds. We, we, we try to get whoever we can from across the publishing spectrum, uh, more or less. And uh, you can come in and, and ask your questions live and pick their brains with, uh, with, our, with our guests. So if you're not yet a uh, member, definitely consider okay. it. Yes, of course. All right, we'll leave you on. I loved this comment from Sword and Shield. This was great. I learned a lot. My writing will be gooder for all I learned today. Thank you, Sword and Shield, for the good <laughs> laugh. Um, tongue in cheek there. Or I wonder about. No, I'm just kidding. I know it's tongue in cheek. So thank you so much, everybody. I had a great time. And uh, I'm looking forward to seeing you around the community or next week at one o'clock. All right. Bye, everybody. Catch you later.